Um, we finished, I think we finished with the uh, brainstem, is that right? Yeah, so um, in our conversation, pretty much what we came up with is that brainstem is responsible for various types of reflex controls and visceral controls. The brain controls visual and um, auditory reflexes, pons participates in the respiratory controls and provides communication between the cortex and cerebellum. Medulla oblongata is the main, um, well, I shouldn't say main, one, well, it does control a lot of visceral um, reflexes, such as reflexes that are dealing with the upper part of digestive system, like swallowing or hiccuping, um, salivating, um, sneezing, vomiting, you know, it also controls respiration to a large extent and cardiovascular system. So those three parts, medulla, pons, and midbrain, they comprise the brain stem. And I want to remind you that controls that, mid, uh, that brain stem exerts, they are, first of all, you, the, the impulses, the, the sensory inputs to the brain stem and motor outputs from the brain stem are unconscious. You don't appreciate them. I mean, you can see the result of those when you're hiccuping, but you have no, absolutely no control over it. Does that make sense? So you have to cl clearly differentiate the uh, controls, the conscious controls from unconscious or involuntary controls. Now the next part of the CNS that is critically important for a motor activities is cerebellum, which cerebellum can be translated as the small brain. Okay, it does look a little bit like a, a small brain. Thank you. It does look like a small brain. You can see it, the cross section of it in the upper right corner. Okay, and that's the anatomical prep of the cerebellum. It's located um, posterior to the brain stem. Okay, r right here. Okay. Um, transverse cerebral fissure. Well, it's not shown here, but you can see on the modal transverse cerebral fissure separates cerebellum from the occipital lobe of the hemispheres. It contains two hemispheres as well. So on the models that are in front of you and on this model, on my model you can see only one hemisphere and here you can see only one hemisphere as well. So this is mid-sagittal section of the cerebellum. Hemispheres are connected by the structure called vermis. If you would look at the models that are on your um, table, you will see that structure in the middle. I have only half of it, but if you would take the glance, you know, from, from the back, the posterior view of the cerebellum, you will see the, the, you have, no, it's fine, just put them, put them together, because then you can see, put them together. And then you can see the little, the little, um, I don't know how to explain, thingy, that connects them right here between the hemispheres. Vermis, if you translate it from Latin, I suppose, means a worm. Okay, so it's like tiny little worm that runs between the hemispheres. So it allows the communication between the hemispheres of the cerebellum. The folds on the cerebellum, called folia, Uh, clearly increase the surface area and if you would look at the uh, cross-section of the cerebellum either on the picture or on the model you're gonna see that cerebellum is comprised of darker cortical tissue and definitely white myelinated neurons 
that form so-called arbor vitae. So arbor vitae, actually, a uh, literal translation of it is the tree of life. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's the tree of life, arbor vitae. So cortex of the cerebellum contains the bodies of neurons, obviously, and that white matter, arbor vitae, provides the communication between the cortical neurons, okay, whether it's communication inside of the cerebellum or communication between cerebellum and other parts of the central nervous system. Uh, cerebellum receives enormous amount of, I'm sorry, cerebellum, uh, didn't mention the lobes, I'm sorry, cerebellum has three lobes, the anterior lobe, the posterior lobe, and floccular nodular lobe. Okay, they have uh, different functions, obviously. So, anterior lobe is responsible for uh, proprioception. Do you understand what proprioception means? No. Fine. Tell me. I love when you say no. I don't understand. No, it makes no no sense. Okay. Proprio means position. Proprioception is the perception of your position in space. Does that make sense to you? It's, it's a term, proprioception. It includes inputs from receptors in the muscles, in the tendons, in the joints. But this time, proprioception in cerebellum is unconscious. Do you see the difference? What it means, think about it. So first of all, when you, when you perform certain type of activity, whether you're sitting or standing or walking or dancing, lying down, face down, face up, you bent over, do you appreciate your position in space? Do you? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I do. Maybe not perfectly all the time, but I do. I know where, when I'm upside down. Does that make sense? That's your conscious proprioception. Now, cerebellum receives all the same stuff, all the same impulses. Trust me, it's not anything different. The thing is, you don't, you don't, you don't know that it receives it. You just don't have a conscious perception of that part of sensory input. Does that make sense? It's just just parallel flow, okay? Now, posterior lobe of the cerebellum is responsible for um, refining your movements. And we'll talk about the damage to cerebellum and what it does, okay? And finally, the flocula, flocculonodular lobe, which I made, floculo nodular lobe responsible for the posture controls it's obviously you know you don't really put any effort in standing upright or sitting upright for that matter does that make sense so those are major functions so the unconscious proprioception which is then um, sort of used that that those impulses are used to produce output, to control move, to refine movements, and to provide you with a proper posture and balance. So, in terms of the input, let's see where the cerebellum receives the inputs. Well, first of all, sensory receptors. Does that make sense? I mean, it. it it, it is not concerned as much with the input, say, from auditory or olfactory receptors, but cerebellum is definitely concerned with inputs from proprioception, okay? Second, since main function of the cerebellum is indirect movement control, it has to communicate with other parts of the central nervous system 
that control movements. What are those parts? What are the cortical parts that control movements? Cortical parts that control movements. Which cortex? Huh? Primary motor and primary motor and premotor. All motor cortices. Because primary motor cortex, you know, directly commands the movements. Cerebellum, and I tend to be anthropomorphic when I talk about parts of the brain, probably too much, but it just, for me, it's easier to explain this way. Think about this. Cerebellum, to make movements precise, needs to know many things, including what happens now, that's primary motor cortex, and what's going to happen in a few seconds, that's premotor cortex. So it receives the inputs from motor cortices about movements, whether they are executed or are being planned. Does that make sense? Another part of the central nervous system that participates in the motor controls is basal nuclei. Remember we talked about those. Basal nuclei inhibit movements. It reduces the unnecessary or excessive movements. So think about cerebellum and basal nuclei as two directors of a company. Okay? They have to communicate constantly. They have to coordinate their activities, their motor outputs, to make movement precise. Does that make sense? So cerebellum has to know what basal, what type of signals basal nuclei produce. So it receives inputs from motor cortex, brainstem nuclei, basal nuclei, and sensory receptors. Now, I mentioned nuclei of brainstem, that's also sensations like vestibular nuclei, okay? Auditory, well, not auditory, visual nuclei, nuclei in the um, midbrain, visual reflex. Now the output. Contractile patterns, okay, which help to produce coordinated and smooth skeletal muscle contractions. Now cerebellum helps to control skeletal muscles. I am being very careful in not saying controls skeletal muscles. Why I'm saying that? Part of the brain, part of the CNS that voluntarily controls skeletal muscles is primary motor cortex. Does that make sense? That's a direct control. Cerebellum has no direct control over the muscles. You got it? No direct control. Which means it does not have access to the neuronal pathways that lead to the muscles. Okay? We'll, we'll, you will see it in a second. But think about it. So cerebellum communicates with the cortex. And the communication between the cortex and the basal nuclei and um, sensory receptors, these communications happen via peduncles. Remember we talked about um, superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles that connect cerebellum to the brain stem? You can kind of see it on this image. So that's superior cerebellar peduncle, middle and inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay? Those uh, parts of the brain, the parts that, well, it's not brain, brain stem and cerebellum, parts that connect, they have uh, specific functions. For instance, superior transmits the instructions from the cerebellar to the motor cortex. Middle transmits the signal 
signals from the motor cortex to the cerebellum. And inferior transmits sensory information from the cerebellum, to the cerebellum, I'm sorry. Does that make sense or not? Let's make a, a little little picture here, okay? So you've got motor cortex, okay? You've got cerebellum. Does that make sense so far? Those two parts. And you've got thalamus in the middle. So cerebellum produces motor outputs. They go through the thalamus to the motor cortex, okay? Motor cortex, in response, sends signals to the cerebellum through the pons about motor activities. And finally, cerebellum also receives the information, wait, not through the thalamus, Directly. Cerebellum receives the information about the more activities from the periphery, the way we stand, you know, whether our muscles are contracted or not. Does that make sense to you? This three way communication. Inputs go out from the cerebellum to the cortex, inputs go in from cortex to the cerebellum, and inputs go in from the periphery to the cerebellum. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make some links here. So this refers to the red portion of the picture. This refers to the blue portion of the picture and this refers to the black portion of the picture. Okay? Can we move on? That's communication wise, it's yeah, it's pretty complicated matter. That's why we're gonna talk about this scheme again. Okay? So this image here shows you the communications between the receptors, the motor cortex, the cerebellum, the basal uh, nuclei and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Let's talk about it. So you've got your motor cortex. Okay? Motor cortex receives inputs from cerebellum. Do you follow me? Blink once if the answer is yes, blink twice if the answer is no. Okay, so that's motor output from cerebellum. How does cerebellum produce this motor output? First, it receives the information about plant contractions from motor cortex. Okay? I should do this. And finally, cerebellum receives information from peripheral sensory receptors like muscle spindles and tendon organs and uh, kinesthetic receptors in the joints. I showed it in black here. So it receives this information. And based on these two inputs, 
inputs regarding the position of body in space, which is, sorry, black is going to be position in space, and blue is going to be planned movements. based on these two inputs, and you can see that those are inputs, okay, they go to the cerebellum. Based on these two inputs, cerebellum plans the motor output. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? No? You want some other, some more explanation, more visual? I, we can do it. I will need um, three people. You can sit. You really can sit. I just need three people fairly close to me so I can communicate. If David wants to participate, that's fine. You can be motor cortex. You can be peripheral um, proprioceptors. I need basal nuclei. Wants to be basal nuclei. Okay, basal nuclei right there. So here's, and, and, um, easy. Are you okay with being skeletal muscle? You don't need to do anything, actually. So David, right there, is the motor cortex. Okay, both primary and pre motor cortex. So he plans, plans a movement, immediately plans the movement, like skilled movement, okay? And then via the, the primary part sends the signal to skeletal muscles. Easy. Okay, that makes sense, that communication there, okay. Now, how does he know how the movement, how is it getting precise, very sharp, okay, like throwing the ball? This is where I, cerebellum, and basal nuclei come into play. So first, David tells me what he's going to, what he's going to do. Okay, so I mean, come up with some movement. Yeah, just whatever. Okay, he's going to run. Okay, make a step while running. So I know what he's going to do. Now I need to understand in what position the body is. So this is Jacques. Tell him what position the body is going to be. No, no, don't care. Don't care what he said. Just what position the body is. Sitting down. Okay. So running while sitting down is like really hard. Okay. But say we try to pull it off and we have like rolling chairs. Okay. That makes sense. Now, um, basal nuclei right there communicates with me and David telling me cerebellum. Okay. I'm going to inhibit some like really excessive movements like that, which are not necessary for that activity. I realized, okay, we're sitting. We are going to run. I'm telling premotor cortex, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to you know, keep certain type of balance. You're going to activate certain type of muscles. You know, you're going to activate them this way. There's going to be certain movement pattern that you're going to execute. And now after communication with me, motor cortex finally sends the signals to the skeletal muscle. Does that make sense? So I receive input from motor cortex, from basal nuclei, from proprioceptors, and then I produce the response. Does that make sense? And only after that, the skilled movement is performed. Okay, so now we spend like two and a half, three minutes on this communication now. If that would be true, Usain Bolt would lose to a turtle in 100 meters, okay? Of course, it happens in an in instant. And all this activity, all this communication is absolutely unconscious. Another thing that I want to highlight in our play here, look, I communicated with David. I didn't tell the word to easy. 
She's skeletal muscles. I do not have any line of communications with skeletal muscles. And Mara, who represented basal nuclei, she doesn't have line of communication as well. You have to clearly understand only primary motor cortex directly communicates to muscles. Does that make sense? It's kind of, it makes your life a little easier. You can think about it in terms of like exclusion, okay? If you see the combination cerebellum and direct control of the muscles, you say, uh-uh, that's not true. Cerebellum doesn't have any direct control over the muscles. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, of course, of course, some output from cerebellum goes to the spinal cord. The output that influences the um, repetitive activities. So, for instance, um, walking, swimming, running, repetitive activities involve controls from the spinal cord. And think about that for a second. When you walk, when you run, do you really think about any, you know, your next stride? You don't. Can you? Yes, you can. I mean, I can think about, I can voluntarily control my leg. That's what I'm doing now to make a stride forward, okay? I do a absolutely conscious movement with my legs. It looks terrible, absolutely terrible, but I can do that. So this repetitive movements called central pattern generators, they, control, they don't involve, they don't involve brain, they don't need brain. Yes. Oh yeah, of course, of course, of course. Central pattern generators are, that's called, so walking, repetitive movements, walking, breathing, running, swimming, are called central pattern generators. And because certain movement patterns is generated in the CNS and, and, and uh, executed by your spinal cord. But essentially, you learn all these things, okay? First, you do it consciously. You learn to swim. You do the, you know what you're doing. Does that make sense? I don't know. You, you, you do, I don't know, the flip on the pull-up bar? It's all here. I mean, I, I saw a lot of people that are strong enough to do the, the flip on the pull-up bar. They cannot do that yet because they didn't learn the move. Once you learned it, it's impossible to forget. It's impossible to forget how to walk. Unless spinal cord is damaged, that's a different story. That makes sense. So yes, you can learn, you can change your running style. Okay? Of course you can change. That's when I'm tripping, when I try to change my running style. Because then my legs go just all over the place. Okay? Now, what's going to be the... Um, it kind of gives you another... Um, idea of the movement control the scheme here so the idea what what I'm gonna what we're gonna do okay so cortex okay cortex tr starts to plan the movement basal nuclei and cerebellum okay it kind of shows here basal nuclei and cerebellum basal nuclei and cerebellum tell cortex do it certain way and then cortex does it certain way, executes the movement. Okay, and cerebellum knows what's going on. Now this is uh, really that's only one thing that is wrong with this scheme. It's although it's it's wrong with many schemes. You can find this on many many flow charts like this. It shows cerebellum controlling the movement. No, it doesn't. All, there's no communication again between cerebellum and the muscles. Does that make sense? Okay. Am I clear? I want to be very, very clear about it. Cerebellum communicates only with the motor cortex. Now, what would be the consequence of the cerebellar damage? What do you think? Yep, 
you're going to be clumsy. It's very well known. Damage to the cerebellum makes people clumsy. Uh, there are some suggestions that cerebellum may be involved in thinking and memory, but with the brain, it's really hard to kind of dissect what is involved in what, because you have to cut out the piece of the brain and see what's going to happen afterwards. It's not really a convenient way. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, uh, limbic system. That's a hell of a data, okay? Don't worry, you don't have to memorize this entire uh, table, no worries, okay? I want to more of it, you know, talk to you what limbic system is. So, limbic system, remember we talked about multimodal limbic association area? Multimodal association area. One of them, there's a prefrontal uh, association, frontal association area, posterior association uh, area and limbic association area. So when you see the word limbic, it refers to the emotions. Does that make sense? Now you have to understand that emotions um, can be conscious and can be sort of unconscious emotions. When I say conscious, um, There are things that you like, rationally like, okay? I mean, maybe not so rationally, but you can appreciate, okay, I like that person. I like that particular dish. You know, I, I don't know. I like that music, okay? So you consciously like certain things. And there are some emotions that sort of wired into the brain. There are some smells that are wired into the brain. Remember, we had a conversation about pheromones. And I told you about that uh, experiment with the sweaty t-shirts. You have absolutely no control of that. You don't even consciously perceive smells like that. There are smells that make you, that will, will just make you throw up. Because they perceived as dangerous. Okay? There are things that we know that, you know, large animals with large teeth, pretty, pretty dangerous to us. Okay? If you don't know that, I mean, you can like big cats all you want, but if you face, face to face with lion, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be scared by that. You know that roar, whether it's a little dog or big lion, is the sign of that this animal is going to attack you or this animal is not happy. So that's what I what I mean by unconscious emotions. Does that make sense? When you you instinctively scared or you instinctively attracted. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so it contains a lot of parts. It doesn't have a representation as a single organ. And I want to focus your um, attention on just very, very few things here. Actually, three. So things that you absolutely must know. Amygdala, which controls fear, also participates in learning and memory. Hippocampus, which pretty much is solely involved in memory formation, and hypothalamus, which is which function is the response to those emotions. When you are scared and your heart starts to race and your blood pressure goes up and your mouth gets dry. That is activity of hypothalamus. Okay. Now, a lot of this, um, a lot of those parts of the brain, parts of the limbic system, you can see they are involved in multiple activities that are rather unconscious. Okay. Alertness, for instance. It's part of the thalamus that's responsible for alertness. 
social context of scene recognition, you know, when you get into this certain environment, you behave a certain way. And damage to this part may change your perception of the environment and make you sort of socially weird. Huh? I mean, the damage to, say, parahippocampal gyrus, which is responsible for uh, proper understanding of social environment, damage to this may make you socially awkward. So you don't appreciate the social context, social environment, the way you should behave in certain conditions. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, of course, um, very precise. We can pin down, as in the video that I that we had a conversation about. You watched it last last uh, week, okay? In that video, you see that by the dysfunction, we can pin down certain things. What are responsibilities of certain parts of the brain? Very important part. Several parts actually of the uh, limbic system are parts of rhinencephalon, emotional responses to the smell. When you smell the food, you start salivating. You feel good. Okay, when it's good response to the smell. Okay, now just try to think about it. For instance, um, when you, like when something is being burned, food is being burned, meat is being burned. Usually the smell is automatically perceived as unpleasant, right? It's not because, uh, oh, my dinner is going to be ruined. It's because, think about this, if, if meat, flesh, is burning, it means that there is a fire somewhere, and somebody is burning in this fire, so you may be in danger, you have to check, you know, what's going on or run away. I mean, now we know that's probably not, it's not fire, but still the perception remains. So a lot of our responses are wired into the brain um, due to the selection pressure that we experienced when, millions of years ago. Now, I want, you, I want to warn you before... Um, I want to warn you against the perception of a human uh, being guided entirely by those unconscious instinctive responses of the brain. We're social animals. A big part of our selection pressure was the formation of society. Okay? So a lot of behaviors that we share were generated, were selected for because we grew up in the society. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, reticular formation is another diffused structure in the brain. By diffused, I mean uh, it cannot be pinned down to a particular organ. Reticular formation contains of multiple structures, nuclei mostly in the brain stem, that are responsible for alertness. Okay, what we call consciousness, arousal. As you can imagine, reticular formation reaches far. Neurons reach organs like hypothalamus, which is responsible for physiological activities. Different cortical areas responsible for conscious perception. Cerebellum, motor control and posture spinal cord, various motor and somatic and visceral activities, okay? So essentially, um, when it is activated, we are alert, like you are now. you conscious. You are alert. When it is inhibited, you're asleep. Does that make sense? Another important, along with alertness and consciousness, which is going to switch to sleep when reticular formation is inhibited, another important function of reticular formation is filtering out the sensory information. It is called habituation. 
this is a very interesting phenomenon that we never actually talked about. Every second, your brain, well, your nervous system, receives enormous amount of sensory inputs. And some of them you don't really appreciate. I'm going to tell you about those. For instance, now every person in this class receives constant sensory inputs from the pressure receptors in your butt because you're sitting on the chair. That's pressure. You don't really perceive all the time, oh, God, I'm sitting on the chair. That's pretty awesome. Your clothing is touching your skin right now. Okay? Now, if you take it off, then you will know and we will. Okay? But other than that, you don't know. I mean, you don't really care. Your brain filters it out. 99% of sensory inputs are filtered out. Does that make sense? Now, important things that those inputs that are filtered out are repetitive. Sensory inputs from your skin about your clothing or sitting on the chair are repetitive. Even visual inputs. So, if you just think about it for a second. So, say, you now, you look at me. Can you look at the slide? So, you focus on those two. You don't see only me. You see this microscope, okay? You see this screen. You see the faucet. You see a lot of stuff. You don't really pay attention to them. You don't really appreciate about anything about those things because they're repetitive. Now, if this faucet will explode, that's going to be a very unusual input, okay? Very drastic change. You would immediately notice it, okay? Does that make sense? That's pretty much um, when you sleep. I have a I have a great example. I have a uh, I, I used to work with one uh, one lady, and she she told me the story. She moved uh, she bought an apartment close to the airport because it was very close to work as well, and it was, it was a good place. The only thing, of course, was the planes. Like every five ten minutes. There was a plane flying pretty much over her head. And for first couple of months, she could barely sleep. Of course, because, you know, she, she's not used to it. And then everything's fine. She lived there for like 25 years. And then she decides to move to another place, pretty much next door to work. It's like really, really nice settings in the forest, the institution where she works, the little apartment building next to it. She moves in, it's away from the airport. Guess what? First two months, she couldn't sleep because there were no planes. Okay? Lack of the usual input. That was actually filtered out. Okay? So that's, that's pretty normal. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, if you interfere with that filtering, you get a lot of interesting visuals. Okay, and as far as I understand, you interfere not only with the conscious perception, like perception, I mean, for instance, I wear shorts, okay, I make, now, I make mental effort, and I feel shorts touching my skin, I kind of pay attention to it, but I don't have to, right, now, there, there's a lot of subconscious activity that constantly goes on in your brain and LSD interferes with filtering out that subconscious activity too. So you are alert but at the same time a lot of thoughts that are normally filtered out because you are alert and you are conscious they start to flood your brain and that's where all these trips come from. Okay. LSD was proposed to treat schizophrenia but never gained enough momentum. Uh, LSD was proposed to treat schizophrenia. That's Timothy Leary in 60s. Albert Hoffman, the guy who synthesized LSD, he was the first guy to try it. Um, 
and he realized he tried it organic chemists are weird people they tend to try things on the tongue so he tried it and then he said he rode his bike to home said it was a pretty interesting bike ride um, yeah and the guy lived like he died a few years ago he was 102 he used LSD till the very very last moment yeah it was he was, he was pretty 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 interesting fellow huh well LSD I do not know the long-term effects I know that there is no reported physical um, what's the a word when you get hooked addiction there is no long there's no reported physical addiction to LSD by physical I mean when you say stop taking opioids that you physically suffer like you're in pain you uh, people I think it starts uh, diarrhea, profuse diarrhea, especially you know people who are in heroin and you know in the in the withdrawal, uh, their hallucinations, all kinds of stuff. On LSD, I do not know of any reported um, physical addiction. There are symptoms of overdose. I don't remember them. There are some. There's well. Reticular formation involves brainstem, okay, because being aroused, being alert, includes proper function of the visceral organs, right? Like proper breathing, proper heart rate, and all that stuff. So if you take too much, and if it inhibits the brainstem, then you may have like a, a depressed respiratory activity or depressed cardiac activity. Yeah, there are things like that, but... I don't know about any long-term psychological effects I I cannot cite any papers about that really cannot okay so I, I don't I don't really know if it I know that there there are there's some work now going on so it's considered again to be used at the very in a very controlled environment to try and treat certain psychological psychiatric conditions okay but I don't know what they're gonna end up with huh yeah yeah they try to they they bring it back yes now another example of the uh, compounds that inhibit reticular formation alcohol tranquilizers sleeping pills all these things put you to sleep eventually Does that make sense well, alcohol is slightly it's a little bit more diff, you know alcohol is more diffuse action it not only inhibits reticular formation it does a lot more are there other bad things like you know irritation of the stomach for instance will, will cause vomiting okay and it will also um, alter the composition of the fluid in your inner ear that's why you get dizzy question I am not sure about the structure of the brain and you get the headache in the morning because you severely dehydrated yeah, Just not I'm not aware really I'm not aware about that don't know okay now again being conscious just kind of I guide you to what what is being conscious first of all physiologically conscious okay so work properly then integrate inputs when you are conscious you get the entire picture of your environment um, by sort of unconsciously combining the inputs visual auditory um, vestibular sensory all that kind of stuff okay and injury to reticular formation results in irreversible coma obviously severe injury to the brain stem will result in death because if there is a, a cardio acceleratory center is damaged your heart's gonna stop that's it okay but if all the visceral functions are intact 
but parts of the brain such as Rafe nuclei that um, control your consciousness and damage, then you know you're unconscious and that's forever. Does that make sense? Is the problem with CNS, and we'll talk about it eventually. It is not neurons in there do not restore; they do not regenerate. That's kind of a bummer. No, brain dead is different, and we're going to talk about it in three, four minutes. So, kind of drawing from the reticular formation, consciousness. Okay, so consciousness is a highest level of brain function. So, if consciousness, lethargy, stupor, and then coma, by declining sorry, alertness, lethargy, stupor, and coma, by declining level of consciousness, okay? When you alert, you have total voluntary control. Okay, if it's not physiologically impaired due to the brain injury, but you have total control. You can think, okay? You can consciously perceive your environment. In lethargy, often people cannot perceive environment. They do not demonstrate the uh, proper level of muscle control. Okay, they don't demonstrate the conscious thinking, and it kind of deteriorates when you go from lethargy to stupor. In stupor, people are barely responsible to outside stimulation, and in coma, they are non-responsible to the outside stimulation. Now, well, I probably will save it for the stroke, but don't mix coma with locked-in syndrome. We'll talk about it, okay? Oh, no, we're going to talk about this here. Yeah, well, I thought to save it for um, brain injury anyway. So when you will, if you will measure the activity of different parts of the cortex, person who's alert, bunch of cortical areas are going to be involved. Like now, your Wernicke's area is involved. Your occipital lobe is pretty much totally involved because that's the visual part. Okay, you're writing, so your certain premotor and motor cortices are involved. Maybe not the entire thing because it, there's not a lot of muscle activity, but involved. And your prefrontal cortex, I hope, is involved, so you analyze information, you ask questions. Does that make sense? So, multiple activities. And those things happen at the same time. That is important. Okay? So that, essentially, when we talk, you know, you hear me talking, you see my sort of drawings on the slides. You see the slide, and w all this information inputs are related to the same topic so then your memory will be recollected maybe in response to different um, triggers maybe a word consciousness maybe somebody will say consciousness maybe you will just see somebody in a coma and that will recollect this memory okay now fainting is the loss of consciousness usually caused by physiological um, reasons. Usually it's a, a cessation of blood flow to the brain. Okay. It's the most common cause of fainting. Um, it can be overwhelming sensory stimulus. For instance, um, very sharp pain may trigger fainting. Okay, I have experienced it when I was nine. I hit the funny bone, and boy, that was awful. And my mom told me we were in the train. She told me not to cry, and next thing I remember, I'm on the floor. Um, physiological, you can cause fainting. I didn't tell you that, by the way. Do 30 very quick squats, then press the person that does squats, you press on that person's chest, it stops the blood flow to the brain, the person will fall unconscious. Don't try it at home. I did. 
ended up with stitches in my head. There was a sim the, the cement fence behind me, just fell on it. I think I was nine, ten, also, yes. Yeah, well, those those people, the people, those people that did that, they didn't catch me, but they guided me to the emergency room. That's good. And I got stitches without anesthesia. It was pretty intense. Um, now, coma is not asleep. It's not fainting. It's in unresponsiveness to stimuli, extended unresponsiveness to stimuli. Okay. Extended lack of oxygen consumption. Trauma. Either to the brain or to the brain stem. Various types of tumors, infections. Uh, extended uh, decrease in the blood glucose. Okay. Um, liver, kidney failure, drug overdose. This is... Uh, a sort of mnemonic if you're interested. I'm not going to ask about mnemonic. Don't worry about this. So, lesion, psychiatric disorder, infection, trauma, endocrine disorders, neoplastic oxygen, you know, oxygen deprivation, metabolic, epileptic, uh, metabolic and endocrine can be pretty much at the same level. I'm going to give you an example of the coma that's, uh, that can be observed in diabetes patients. So in diabetes patients, um, in type 1, well, type 2 to also, but type 2 is slightly different. So let's talk about type 1. They don't produce insulin, right? So their blood glucose goes really, really high. The problem is not only that their blood glucose goes really, really high. The problem that without insulin, their cells cannot take in glucose. Okay? That's why the blood glucose goes high. So first, brain becomes very glucose deprived. So the activity of neurons and brain hugely depends on the glucose. The activity of the uh, neurons decreases. Does that make sense? Second problem, since there is no glucose getting into the cells, cells start to use other sources of energy, namely fats. When you use fat, as the sole source of energy in the cell, fat metabolism without glucose eventually produces a large number of ketones and keto acids. When ketones and keto acids are released in the blood, they drop the pH of the blood, make it more acidic. This is called metabolic ketoacidosis. Acidification of the blood and therefore extracellular fluid depresses the signal transmission between the neurons. So now I have two things. First, neurons are deprived of glucose, and second, the ionic flow, propionic flow in the synapses is inhibited. Signal transmission ceases, and the patient falls in the coma, so-called hypoglycemic coma, hyperglycemic coma, I'm sorry. Does that make sense? So that's metabolic cause of coma. Now, this graph shows you <clears throat> the level of um, alertness, which is kind of split into things. So, awareness is sort of a sensory alertness. Vigilance is the motor alertness. So, now you have both at a very high level. So, you, you hear, okay? You consciously perceive the environment around you and you can perform uh, movements, right? Now, when you become sleepy, you know, you get less and less aware of your environment, and you get less and less movements. Does that make sense? Different, different kinds of sleep have different levels of alertness. Interesting here, the vegetative state and dementia are characterized by the Vigilance, very high vigilance. Okay, so people can produce movements 
but they have practically no awareness about their surrounding. Okay. Um, Special people with dementia, uh, my grandmother, and later in life she developed severe dementia. She could just leave home and she to get totally lost, okay? Because she was, she was pretty vigilant. She could walk, she could like take a bus, but she had no idea where she lived, who she were, and stuff like that. So that's, that's dementia. Um, parasomnia are various abnormalities associated with sleep. We're going to talk about them. One of them is um, moonwalking, night walking, okay? Yeah, 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 sleepwalking, yeah. Um, now, seizures. Low awareness. Person in seizures is practically no awareness of the surroundings. Uh, but certain vigilance, of course, otherwise seizures wouldn't be possible. Anesthesia and coma put you in a pretty much the same uh, level of alertness. When you're fully anesthetized, you have absolutely no perception of the environment, and you have no motor control. Okay. Now, the one thing that I didn't mention I wanted to talk to you about is the locked-in syndrome. Does anyone know what it is? Sleep paralysis is the very short-term uh, thing that we can talk about. Yeah. So locked-in syndrome is um, a very interesting and pretty pretty dramatic condition, which happens often to the victims of uh, stroke patients. Yes. So uh, due to often diffuse damage to the cortex, they completely lose control over the skeletal muscles entirely. They have proper visceral controls. I mean, they or, their organs function properly. And what's most dramatic, they brain, they, uh, they are absolutely aware of, about the environment, okay? And they have perfect capacity for reasoning and thinking. There is a French movie that is, uh, in English translation, is called a butterfly and the diving bell. It is intensely boring, unbelievably boring. Um, it lasts for an hour and a half. Two minutes is what I need to tell you what it's about. So the guy wakes up after the stroke, he's locked in. One, he has functional blindness and lack of blood supply to one of the eyes. Uh, another eye is fully functional, so he has a control over the eye muscles. He can move the eye and he can uh, close and open the eyelids. So he film starts, the movie starts with a scene where his another eye, which he has no control over, is being surgically removed. And he's like, he's totally conscious. So he kind of, that's from his kind of viewing point, okay? And so what he's, he has, and the reason for that is an infection, no tears are produced, so it's kind of a pain and he has to keep this eye alive and he doesn't see with it anyway. So there's only one eye and that's it. I mean, he hears, he sees, he smells, he can't say anything, he can't move any part of the body except the eyelids and the eye. And very quickly, in like first five, seven minutes, the nurse, unfortunately, I watched this long, the nurse um, identifies that he actually is conscious, that he's locked in, that he's fully aware of his conditions. And she starts to communicate with him. You know, they develop way communication. He blinks or something, does something like that. Of course, it's very, very slow. Like she points at the ladder and he blinks. Yeah, that's ladder. Does that make sense? And they build like words and he can build sentences and everything. And then she helps him to write the book. And that's it. And in the end, he dies. So like two minutes, right? That's it. That's, that's the whole movie. It's so, like they write book for an hour and 20 minutes. It's sad. It's sappy. Don't get me wrong. It got the tone of prizes, a number of festivals, but in no way anything similar to Transformers, um, which is one of my favorite movies, honestly, I like when everything explodes. Yeah, it's called Butterfly and the Diving Bell. Yeah, uh, my wife liked it. 
couldn't care less. Uh, but the story is interesting, and, and interesting. It's based on a true story. It's, it was a real patient. I just find it very un, not entertaining. Let's put it this way. And it's kind of you kind of see what's going on. Okay, this guy's going to write the book, and he dies in the end. Okay, sad. Yes. I mean, I don't want to kind of be condescending. That's awful. I would hate to be in this position. That's horrible, really. And this guy's the brave person that he managed to, you know, pull through this whole thing. I, I can't even imagine what it's like to be in this position. But that's, that's a known condition, the locked-in syndrome. Now, with this, um, did, you, did you ask about brain dead? Did you, okay, you asked about brain dead. So we're going to talk about brain waves. So um, we talked about the, the cortex, right? And things that comprise the cortex. And what are, what cortex, the gray matter, what is it, what does it consist of? Mm -hmm. Neuronal bodies, right? Well, they don't just hang in place. They're connected to each other, okay? So there's a communication, um, and this communication, this signal, the action potential, what it is, action potential, what's that? By nature. Is that like just tapping, like mechanical vibration, what it is? It's electric signal, right? So it's electric signal. It turns out we can measure the electrical activity in the cortex. Just put electrodes like this this guy, you know, he has electrodes, and they measure the electric activity. It's called electroencephalogram, EEG. And um, we can measure it in the form of waves with different frequency. Okay, the highest frequency is beta waves, and quite reasonably, highest frequency of the brain waves corresponds to the highest level of alertness, highest level of brain activity. That's that's when you conscious, when you think, when you recognize things. Also, you know, uh, anxiety, a fight or flight, so active responses. Does that make sense? That's beta waves. Alpha waves are relaxation. Okay? When you're relaxed, alpha waves with the lower... Um, level lower frequency are produced alpha waves are observed in the condition um, before waking up or before falling asleep okay and those are really interesting conditions okay now when uh, condition when frequency goes lower that's theta waves and that's your dreaming sleep when you see the imagery in your sleep, okay? Also, theta waves are associated with memory formations. When we were in college, we had a, that kind of explains our superstition. When we were in college, we had a tradition, you have an exam, the night before the exam, you take a textbook and put it under your pillow and hope that all the knowledge from the textbook will magically transfer into your brain while you're sleeping. It never worked. Um, and finally, the least frequent, the dreamless sleep. So that's the deepest sleep. That's the moment that you have no dreams. You are unaware of your muscles, of your body. You don't know what's going on. Okay? That's deepest state of sort of being kind of, kind of sort of unconscious. Okay, so um, of course shapes of brain waves are not uniform for every person. Uh, as far as I remember, children experience more alpha waves than adults. For instance, drugs may change the shape of the brain waves. Um, diseases may change the shape of the brain waves. Okay, um, epilepsy. 
People in epilepsy have different shapes of brain waves. People that have certain types of sleep disorders may have different shapes of brain waves. This person may be asleep, but if a person experiences, say, alpha, beta brain waves, it suggests that it's not right. Okay? Um, now, answering your question, brain dead. Brain dead means lack of brain waves at all, lack of any cortical activity. Even people in coma and irreversible coma, they have activity in the brain, okay, spontaneous waves. If no more waves are observed, the person is brain dead. And you can imagine that using machines, you can maintain the function of the body for a long time. But once the person is brain dead, there is no coming back. Okay? Irreversible coma is the situation when the damage to the reticular formation prevents the complete arousal. So it's kind of a, 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 hor it's, it's, it's a horrible situation. It's loss-loss situation. The person is not brain dead, but the person is not going to come back to consciousness. Okay, so that's, that's tough. And I don't want to touch euthanasia part with the six-foot pole. No, thank you. Um, okay. Now, um, considering, you know, the, the brain waves, so sleep. Um, now, that's important. Partial unconscious. No, I'm not going to say that. Unconsciousness. Okay. Good try. Partial unconsciousness. Which means when you are asleep, you can be awakened, but not by everything. Think about this. You sleep well. Okay. And different kinds of noises may not necessarily wake you up. But alarm clock will. It may not, but in most cases it will. Does that make sense? Like, um, I, when I was a student, I worked in a very noisy environment. And I had no problem falling asleep in a very noisy environment. But the ringing phone woke me up. So I could sleep when the, the like, the semi-trailer was working in like 20 feet away from me, but the phone ringing woke me up. So that's, again, plays into the reticular formation, filtering repetitive inputs, but leaving the space, leaving the sort of gates open for the important, you know, unexpected, loud stimulus. Um, so there are two major types of sleep, non rapid eye movements and rapid eye movement. Different patterns of brain waves and there are four stages of non rapid eye movement and um, one REM so here how you sleep now this graph is a little maybe a little confusing so this is the, um, the sequence when you fall asleep so you fall in your sleep and you get into the stage one non rapid eye movement and from one to four, pretty much the difference, it's deeper and deeper sleep. So you go from alpha waves to delta and theta waves. And then in the non-rapid eye movement sleep stage four, pretty much delta waves dominate. That's really deep sleep, but that is the type of sleep when you have terrors, when people pee in the bed, when people do sleepwalking. So the fact that people can walk while they sleep means that they have some level of control over their muscles. However, if they, when they fall asleep you know, when they fall down farther, when they go into the rapid eye movement part. That's the part where people dream. Okay? Like, actually, like, those colorful dreams and everything. And that's the part when your muscles 
are inhibited. And that's very important. Why? Uh huh. So if I can, if in the dream you're punching someone in the face, you don't punch someone in the face while you are in bed. Or you don't fall from bed and stuff, similar things. Does that make sense? So you have four non-rapid eye movement stages. On the fourth, is sort of most dangerous. That's like when you have a chance to like have terrors or stand up from your bed and walk somewhere. But if you pass through it, you're in the best part. Rapid eye movement sleep. That's when you're dreaming. That's when you can't move. And few things that... Um, I, Mar, did you ask about uh, sleep paralysis? Asynchronization, when you wake up, you're consciously awake, but the inhibition of skeletal muscles didn't go away yet. That's sleep paralysis. Happens in about 60% of population once, you know, a few times in a lifetime. So that's pretty normal. I mean, you don't treat things like that. Other interesting, I think, interesting pathologies. Well, we all know about insomnia. Problem falling asleep. Sort of opposite to it is narcolepsy. Is when you kind of you not overwhelming drowsiness means that people can just you know sit at the table and suddenly fall asleep and then wake up, but they're not fully alert like you are now. Okay, so that's pathological condition. Um, restless leg syndrome is sort of self-explanatory. People move legs when they're sleeping. It happens to many people, uh, or if it's not bothering, doctors usually don't treat it. I don't know, happened to me several times. Jet lag, um, you can count it as a sleep disturbance, but it's more of a circadian rhythm disturbance. Okay? For instance, when I travel from here to Russia, so say I leave at noon, my travel is about 19 hours. Okay, I'm 17. The layover in New York, 17. Okay, so I should be there like 9, right? And when I arrive, it's like 3 p.m. So it might, well, it's really good because I have really long day, like really long day. So by 8 p.m. I'm dead. Okay, so, but I'm still jet lagged because I wake up like 4 a.m. in the morning, okay, and I want to go to bed at 8 p.m. because of the time difference. So it's all screwed up. Um, disorders that are associated with abnormal uh, um, rapid eye movement stage when sort of rapid eye movement and non-rapid eye movement stage 4 kind of get mixed up. People experience night terror, sleepwalking, things like that. Uh, sleep apnea. Uh, it's not so much sleeping disorder per se. It's the uh, yeah, it's a, when people stop breathing while they are asleep. It's a very common problem um, in people who are obese. Because they have physiological problems breathing. And that leads to them waking up. Okay, and that leads to the impaired sleep quality. And the treatment for sleep apnea caused by obesity is, guess what? Losing weight. Um, Circadian rhythm sleep disorder. That's the night, nice way to call night owls. That's pretty much when you go to bed at like 3 a.m. in the morning and you wake up at, mid, at, at, at noon. That's a great question. It's a great question. It depends on what kind of blindness we're talking about. Because if the blindness is caused by the damage to the optic nerve, then, and complete damage to the optic nerve, then technically, and I specifically like both optic nerves, then of course inputs from the optic nerve will not reach uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus and will not, light will not participate in the regulation of circadian rhythms. However, circadian rhythms are not 
only regulated by the light inputs. On the other hand, if the blindness is caused, say, by macular degeneration, so a person cannot see, but parts of the retina are still functional, they still send signals, but they cannot be interpreted by the cortex as the visual signals. Okay, so, but if those inputs, inputs about light and darkness, still reach hypothalamus, then melatonin is going to be produced and inhibited, and it's still going to participate in the sleep regulation. So it depends on what kind of blindness that is. Does that make sense? Um, exploding head syndrome, I just love the name. Hmm? That's actually what it is. I mean, not that your head literally explodes, but people hear very loud noises. I mean, they don't hear them, but they perceive as they heard very loud noise. Uh, it's, I actually, I personally had, have it, you know, once in a while. When I lay, when I've fallen asleep, and, or wait, usually when I'm falling asleep. And then I hear like somebody screaming. And I wake up and nobody's screaming, obviously. I, I know that nobody's screaming. So it's sort of a, it's, it's pretty much the auditory hallucination. Same goes, there's uh, a term called hypnagogia. I don't know if you've heard about it or not. When people fall asleep or wake up, sometimes they have sort of visuals. You can call them hallucinations if you want. Visuals that do not belong to the actual environment. The exploding head syndrome belongs to the same group of phenomena. Does that make sense? When you, it's, it's pretty much auditory hallucination can happen when you fall asleep, when you wake up. Uh, we're going to take a break, and when we'll come back, we'll...